This is part five of our teaching on the principles of the greater Exodus. And in parts one through three, we looked at principles and patterns in the scripture by which we can understand the way in which the God of Israel is going to bring about the end of the exile of Jacob, the uniting of the 12 tribes of Israel, the uniting of northern kingdom and southern kingdom, northern kingdom being Ephraim, also known as the house of Joseph, the southern kingdom, the house of Judah, in fulfillment of the prophecy of Ezekiel chapter 37, verses 15 through 28, in the end of days. And by looking at the principles and the patterns, we can see the way in which this will happen by the Messiah in events that are associated with Messianic times. And so then in the last part, part four, we looked at the events that are associated with the end of the exile of Jacob, sometimes called the greater exodus. And we saw that it's associated or linked with the nations dividing the land of Israel and the city of Jerusalem through the creation of a Palestinian state whereby they want to have East Jerusalem as its capital, that this will bring about the judgment of the nations. And in judging the nations, central in the judgment of all nations is the fall of an end-time entity called in the scriptures the daughter of Babylon that has the characteristics of the historical Babylon that was under the rulership of King Nebuchadnezzar, but is an end-time nation, which I believe is the United States of America. Yet Babylon is a system that is financial, that is political, and that is religious. And so the different elements and aspect of the Babylonian system will fall as well. And that these events are associated with Messianic times, which the Bible uses the term, the day of the Lord. And so we looked at the day of the Lord and the prophecies that are associated with the day of the Lord as it relates to this matter. And just as we see in Genesis in the creation pattern that evening and morning is a day that we then can understand that that's prophetic or a prophetic foreshadowing of the eschatological day of the Lord, which is the prophetic Sabbath, which is the Messianic era, that it is a thousand years long and that the day of the Lord is going to begin with destruction, with darkness, as a thief in the night. And what we call this period of time is the tribulation or the great tribulation period. So the tribulation, great tribulation, is a part of the day of the Lord. It's the darkness part of the day of the Lord. And the darkness ends with the breaking of the day and Yeshua's setting his feet down on the Mount of Olives is at the dawn or the break of the day. And then we have a time of light where he rules and reigns in his kingdom and teaches the Torah to all nations from Jerusalem, Isaiah chapter 2, verse 3, because the Torah is called light. And we can see that the Torah is called light from Proverbs in chapter 6 and verse 23. And so the light part of the day of the Lord is when the Messiah is going to set up his kingdom and he's going to be teaching his Torah to all nations. And so then in looking at a central way in which the nations are going to be judged, we looked at the end of 
part four that in Zechariah 14 verse 12 we're told that the judgment that comes upon the nations that fought against Jerusalem that their flesh will consume away where they stand upon their feet their eyes shall consume away in their holes and their tongue shall consume away in their mouth describing chemical biological but primarily nuclear warfare and so this is a conflict which the Bible calls the controversy of Zion and it's a spiritual conflict between Jacob and Esau in Genesis chapter 25 Esau sold his birthright to Jacob but instead of just giving it up and leaving it be Esau wants the blessing and the benefit of having that birthright and so we see in the blessings that Jacob gave to his children that the sons of Joseph Ephraim and Manasseh was given the blessing of the firstborn Genesis 48 and in Genesis chapter 49 Judah was given the blessing of the kingship that here in the end of days Esau is fighting with Jacob and he wants to take back his birthright and he wants to rule and reign have in essence the power of the kingship and so the mountains of Israel Judea Samaria or the West Bank that is the primary area where we have the land inheritance of the sons of Joseph Ephraim and Manasseh and Judah was given Jerusalem so when Esau is trying to make the claim that the mountains of Israel belongs to him now the mountains of Israel includes the West Bank but extends into Jerusalem as we see in the prophecy of Ezekiel 35 and Ezekiel 36 where Esau is trying to say that the mountains of Israel belongs to him what's going on here is that Esau is trying to claim the birthright from Joseph in the kingship from Judah so Jacob Joseph and Judah together are in a spiritual battle or conflict with Esau wherein the nations are siding with Esau that the mountains of Israel should be divided that there should be a Palestinian state based upon 1967 borders with East Jerusalem as its capital and in doing so Esau is causing the nations to side with him the one that's ultimately orchestrating all this causing the rebellion of the nations we know in the scriptures is Lucifer the devil Hasatan the adversary who Esau is siding along with the nations in opposition to Yeshua who made covenant with Abraham as Paul explained in Galatians 3 16 where we can cross-reference what he's stating there with Genesis 17 verse 7 wherein Yeshua made promise to Abraham Isaac and Jacob that he would fulfill the promise that he initially made with Abraham that was conferred and reiterated to Isaac and Jacob and so um, we're understanding these things as it relates to getting a perspective of how is the greater exodus going to come about in the generation that sees Messiah set his feet down on the Mount of Olives well in Zechariah chapter 12 verse 2 it says I will make Jerusalem a cup of trembling unto all the people round about when they that is the nations will be in the siege against Judah and against Jerusalem so wanting to divide the land of Israel in the city of Jerusalem is the nations sieging Judah um, and Jerusalem and so we're told here that the Almighty is making Jerusalem a cup of trembling well the word cup is the Strong's number 5592 in the Strong's Hebrew dictionary and it's the Hebrew word saf he's going to make Jerusalem a saf well saf in the book of Exodus is translated as bowl or basin but the word saf also means a threshold so we could understand that the Almighty is saying that he's going to make Jerusalem a threshold in other words he's designated the boundaries of Jerusalem 
and he's declared that Jerusalem is his. And if you cross the boundary and you want to take Jerusalem for yours and not acknowledging the God of Israel, not acknowledging the Messiah of Israel, not acknowledging the one that made covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, even Yeshua, the Messiah, that you're invading his house and he's going to judge the thief that's coming into his house to Jerusalem and crossing the threshold. And so one of the letters of the Hebrew alphabet is the Hebrew letter Shin. It most resembles the letter W in the English alphabet. And so the Hebrew letter, you can either put a, uh, a reference mark, it's called a dagish, and in the Hebrew letter shin that looks like a W, if you put the dot on the left hand side of the letter, the letter is pronounced sin. But if you put the dot on the right hand side, it's pronounced shin. And this dot is called a dagish. And so if we look at the dot being on the right hand side in the letter being pronounced as a shin, if we look at the physical geography of Jerusalem from an aerial view, we will see that Jerusalem encompasses three valleys. On the right hand side, you have the Kidron Valley. On the left hand side, you have the Hinon Valley. And in the middle is the Tyropian Valley. And so if you draw in where these valleys would be, it's going to form the Hebrew letter Shin. And then if you plot where the temple is, the Temple Mount, it's going to be associated with the Dagish on the right hand side. And so he, so topographically, from an aerial viewpoint, Jerusalem is physically laid out like the Hebrew letter Shin. And the Hebrew letter Shin is one of the letters in the Hebrew alphabet that represents or stands for the God of Israel and his name. And so this is how that Jerusalem is a threshold of the God of Israel because we're told in 2 Kings, in chapter 21 and verse 4, we've told the following about Jerusalem, that King Manasseh built altars in the house of the Lord, of which the Lord said, In Jerusalem will I put my name. So he put his name in Jerusalem. In what way? Through the Hebrew letter Shin, as we just saw from the aerial photograph. And so now in Joel, in chapter 3, verse 2, it talks about the nations are going to divide the land. And then it says in Joel chapter 3, verse 14, multitudes, multitudes, and it's translated as the valley of decision. For the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. So the prophecy says that as the day of the Lord comes, that the nations and even individuals are going to have to decide where they stand. And the decision is, are you standing with the covenant that was made with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Are you standing on Mount Zion, or are you opposing the covenant that was made with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Are you advocating, and, you, and do you desire to see a Palestinian state based upon 1967 borders with East Jerusalem as its capital? Well, in Joel chapter 3, verse 14, where it says, multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision, the word decision here is the Strong's number 2742 in the Strong's Hebrew Dictionary. And it's the Hebrew word harutz. And one of the meanings of harutz is it's translated as a threshing instrument because a threshing instrument makes a cut and severs one from another. That's why it's also understood 
as a strict decision because when you make a decision, you decide I'm doing this instead of that. And so multitudes, multitudes making a decision, multitudes, multitudes being threshed. And so the decision is, do you believe the covenant made with Abraham, Isaac and Jacob? And are you going to acknowledge the sovereignty and the kingship of the God of Israel? Or are you going to stand opposed and in defiance to the covenant made with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Because the scriptures say in Isaiah chapter 51, verses 1 through 3, that believing in the covenant that was made with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is the comfort of zeal. Isaiah chapter 51, 1. Hearken to me, you that follow after righteousness, you that seek the Lord, you that want to follow after the ways of the God of Israel, which is following his Torah, which is believing that Yeshua is the Messiah. Look unto Abraham your father, meaning the covenant that was made with Abraham that went to Isaac and Jacob. Before in doing so, or standing upon and believing that covenant that is tried and tested, Isaiah chapter 28, verse 16, that is how the Lord will comfort Zeo. What is the comfort of Zeo? The comfort of Zeo is the end of the exile of the house of Jacob. And so believing in the covenant, standing for the covenant, is the way in which his people are going to be comforted. And so we can see in Isaiah 40, verse 1, Comfort ye, comfort ye, my people. Isaiah 51, verse 3, For the Lord will comfort Zion. Comfort ye, comfort ye, my people. The comfort is associated with Zion, and the comfort is associated with the end of the exile. Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 13. Then will the virgin rejoice in the dance, both young men and old together. I will turn their mourning... That's exile, into joy. That's the end of the exile. I will comfort them. The comfort is the end of the exile of the house of Jacob. We can see this by looking more closely at Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 10. Hear the word of the Lord, O you nations, and declare it in the isles afar off, and say, He that scattered Israel will gather him. So the one that gathers him is going to be the Messiah. And Yeshua said... In John chapter 10, verse 11 and verse 14, that he is the good shepherd. So he that scattered Israel will gather him and keep him as a shepherd. The one that gathers is going to gather as a shepherd. And the one that's going to gather as a shepherd, that's Yeshua the Messiah, is the one that scattered. And the one that scattered, scattered because the people broke the covenant at Mount Sinai, which means if the one that gathers is a shepherd, that is the one then that entered into covenant with his people where they broke the covenant, he scattered them, that the one that gathers is also the one that scattered. That would be Yeshua the Messiah. And from this we can see that he also gave the Torah at Mount Sinai. Now Jeremiah 31 verse 12, Therefore they will come and sing in the height of Zion. He that scattered Israel will gather. They will sing in the height of Zion. Then it says in Jeremiah 31, verse 13, I will turn their mourning into joy. I will comfort them. So the word comfort is going to be associated with the end of the exile. And continuing on in Jeremiah chapter 31, we see in verse 15 that Rachel is weeping for her children. She's refused to be comforted. Because they were not. See, as long as Rachel's children are in exile, Rachel was not comforted. But then Rachel's told prophetically in Jeremiah 31 verse 16, Refrain your voice from weeping and your eyes from tears. Rachel's told to quit weeping. For your work shall be rewarded, says the Lord, and they will come again from the land of the enemy, from exile. Verse 17, there is hope in your end, says the Lord, that your children will come again to their border. So the comfort of Rachel prophetically is when her children come to their own border. They're no longer in exile. And so 
where we see the double comfort mentioned in Isaiah 40, verse 1, comfort ye, comfort ye, my people, that this proclamation of comfort is going to be associated with Elijah's ministry and thus Elijah's message. Because after it says in Isaiah 40, verse 1, comfort ye, comfort ye, my people, it says in verse 3, the voice of him that cries in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. So this is the verse in Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 3 that's quoted of John the Baptist or Yochanan the Immerser from Matthew in chapter 3. So if we look at Matthew in chapter 3 and then we start reading in verses 1 through 3. In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And so referring to John in his ministry, it says in verse 3, For this is he that was spoken by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Now, uh, in the birth of Yochanan the Immerser, or John the Baptist, in Luke chapter 1, in verses 16 and 17, we can see his ministry. It says, In many of the children of Israel shall he turn to the Lord their God, and he shall go before him in the spirit and the power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. That is the coming of the Messiah. So then Yeshua was asked about this in Matthew chapter 17, verse 10. The disciples asked Yeshua, why do the scribes, or we would say today the rabbis, teach that Elijah must come first or precede the coming of the Messiah. And Yeshua answered and said, Elijah truly shall first come and restore all things. That's future. He will come. And when he comes, he's going to restore. But I say to you that Elijah has come already. Then the disciples understood that he spoke of John the Baptist, Yochanan the Immerser. And so... Elijah and his ministry precedes the coming of the Messiah. And Messiah is coming to forgive the sins of his people. And he's coming to end their exile. He's coming to fulfill the covenant that was made with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And the ending of the exile is associated with comfort. So Isaiah 40 verse 1, comfort ye, comfort ye my people. And then what's said about that comfort Isaiah 40, verse 3, the voice of him that cries in the wilderness, this is the ministry of Elijah. And so speaking about the comfort that is associated with the ministry of Elijah, it says in Isaiah chapter 40, verses 10 and 11, the Lord will come with a strong hand, his arm will rule for him. And so the one that's coming with a strong hand, a strong hand in his arm is going to rule. That's the Messiah. His reward is with him. The, the reward of the Messiah. See, this verse is quoted of Yeshua in Revelation in chapter 1, verse 7. Behold, he comes with clouds and every eye will see him. And they also which pierced him and all the kings of the earth shall wail because of him. Amen. And then it goes on to say that um, his reward is with him. And so regarding the comforting of his people through the ministry of Elijah, wherein the Messiah is going to come and perform his work, which is to Isaiah 40 verse 11, to feed his flock like a shepherd and gather the lambs. The work of the Messiah is to gather and unite the 12 tribes of Israel. And so... Elijah's ministry or Elijah's message is to repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand to prepare for the coming of the Messiah and Elijah's message is expressed in calling the people to come out of mixed worship 
Babylon is mixed worship. The golden calf is mixed worship. The sin of Jeroboam, where he tried to worship the God of Israel, but he set up alternative places of worship in the north of Israel in Dan and then in Bethel, that this is mixed worship and calling them to the Torah as the Torah was given. Calling them to follow the God of Israel by following his Torah. And so that's one element and aspect of Elijah and his ministry. And the second element is to prepare the people for the coming of the Messiah who's going to come and gather and unite the 12 tribes of Israel. So we can see both aspects of this ministry in 1 Kings chapter 18, verses 30 and 31, where it says, Elijah said to all the people, Come near unto me, and all the people came near unto him. And it says in the translation that he repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. And so the word repaired is the Strong's number 7495 in the Strong's Hebrew Dictionary. It's the Hebrew word Rapha, which is often translated as to heal. And so Elijah healed the altar now, how do you heal the altar? Well, you put proper worship upon the altar. You worship the God of Israel in the way that he said that he should be worshipped. And so then in 1 Kings 18, 31, Elijah took 12 stones according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob. So this is the second part of Elijah's ministry is he's going to gather the 12 stones. Um, he's going to prepare the people's hearts for the coming of the Messiah, whose work is to gather and unite the 12 tribes of Israel. And so Elijah's ministry is going to be associated with proclaiming the gathering and uniting of the 12 tribes of Israel. Now we can see that this is understood to be the task of Elijah and his ministry is to prepare the people for the gathering and uniting of the 12 tribes of Israel by the Messiah from the book, The Messiah Texts, by Raphael Patai on page 144. And first it states a fact of the Bible that you could only see in the Hebrew language. And the fact is the following, that everywhere in the Bible, the name Jacob, which in Hebrew is Yaakov, is spelled in the text, in the Hebrew, without the Hebrew letter Vav. So every time you have Jacob or Yaakov, in the biblical text, that his name does not have the Hebrew letter Vav, except for five places in the text that does have the Hebrew letter Vav. Then another fact, that the name Elijah, which in Hebrew is Eliyahu, that everywhere it appears in the biblical text, it is spelled with the Hebrew letter Vav, except for five places in the text that Elijah or Eliyahu's name is spelled in the text without the Hebrew letter Vav. So those two things are fact of Scripture. Now we're going to get an interpretation of those facts by the rabbis. And so they ask the question, why? And their explanation is to teach you that Elijah will come and redeem the seed of Jacob. That Jacob took the Vav from the name of Eliyahu. This is what we call a Midrash. It is an explanation to give you the meaning of the text. So Jacob didn't literally take the Vav, but midrashically, Jacob is taking the Vav from the name of Elijah as a pledge. Now listen to this. Elijah will come and announce the redemption of the world to his children. Elijah's ministry is to prepare the people of the God of Israel for the coming of the Messiah, to point out to them where they're in mixed worship, to call them to worship the God of Israel in spirit and in truth, calling them uh, to the, the Torah that was given at Mount Sinai and to prepare their hearts for the gathering uniting of the 12 tribes of Israel and even to show the people how and the way in which it is going to come about. This is Elijah's ministry and this is Elijah's message. And so now what we're going to do is we're going to give you a little bit more detail regarding what the scriptures have to say in the judgment of the nations and specifically regarding the judgment that comes to this entity called in the Bible as the daughter of Babylon, 
And the scriptures have much to say about the judgment of Babylon. But if you look closer at the text, it says the daughter of Babylon. In, in Isaiah chapter 13, Isaiah 21, Isaiah 47, Jeremiah 50, 51, Revelation in chapter 18. That this daughter of Babylon has the characteristics of the historical, literal Babylon by which King Nebuchadnezzar ruled over, but it's an end time nation. And so I'm going to show you the description of this daughter of Babylon, wherein I believe it is referring to the United States of America. But first I remind you that the prophecy says in Joel chapter 1 verse 15 that in the day of the Lord that the nations, Joel chapter 3 verse 2, will divide the land of Israel. And this will bring about the judgment of the nations as is outlined in Isaiah chapter 34 where it says in verse 1, Come near you nations to hear. Verse 2, For the indignation of the Lord is upon all nations. So in speaking about the judgment that's going to come upon all nations, we're told the reason why in verse 8, that it's the day of the Lord, it's the day of the Lord's vengeance, in the year of payback to the nations, for the controversy of zeal. And it's when the nations are being judged, that this period of time when they divide the land is in the day of the Lord and they're being judged during the tribulation period which is called Jacob's trouble Jeremiah 30 verse 7 alas for that day is great it's none like it it's the time of Jacob's trouble and even though it's Jacob's trouble because of the conflict that he's in with Esau over the battle over the the birthright in the kingship and to whom will have the birthright in the kingship where the God of Israel said it belongs to Jacob but Esau wants it that Jacob would be delivered or saved from the hand of Esau and from the nations who want to divide the land. But the nations are going to be judged. Jeremiah chapter 30 verse 11. I am with you, says the Lord, to save you, though I make a full end of all nations where I've scattered you. So he's going to make a full end of nations where they've been scattered. In one of the places where the exiles of Israel have been scattered here at the end of days is the United States of America. So we're going to look at the fall and the prophesied fall of Babylon in the end of days. And we're going to look at the United States of America as the end time spiritual land of Babylon. Remember, Babylon is a term for the kingdom of darkness. And ultimately, Hasatan is over the kingdom of Babylon, the kingdom of darkness. And Babylon has many facets. And it is financial. It is political. It is religious. Um, it is a land. And what we're going to look at is an end time spiritual land of the definition of this Babylonian system. So the prophecies is uh, Isaiah chapter 13, verse 1. The burden of Babylon. And it says in verse 17, I will stir up the Medes against them. And so... We have a prophecy that the daughter of Babylon will be at war in the end of days at the tribulation period at the time of the dividing of the land and the gathering uniting the 12 tribes of Israel by the Messiah will be at a war with the Medes and today the Medes are the Iranians. We can see this in Jeremiah chapter 51 verse 1. Thus says the Lord, I will raise up against Babylon a destroying wind. Verse 11, make bright the arrows. The Lord has raised up the spirit of the kings of the Medes. The spirit of the kings of the Medes. In other words, they, they had the attitude that the historical kings of the Medes had toward Babylon, which means they wanted to wage war against it. For his device is against Babylon to destroy it. We also see this in Jeremiah chapter 51, where in verse 1 it says, I will raise up against Babylon a destroying wind. Verse 28, prepare against her the nations with the kings of the Medes. So we have the spirit of the kings of the Medes that wants to oppose Babylon, but it's not just the Medes. It's the Medes along with the nations who are with her. So in modern day times, who might this be? Who is going to be in alliance with Iran against the United States that would come against her? Well, 
we're looking at nations like Russia, China, North Korea, and others. Well, the prophecy is in Jeremiah chapter 51 that Babylon falls in the day of trouble, in the day of the Lord. Jeremiah 51.1, I will raise up against Babylon a destroying wind. And it says in verse 2, that they will empty her land, for in the day of trouble they shall be against her round about. So this end time entity, the daughter of Babylon, the end time spiritual land of Babylon, falls. And it's a time associated with the vengeance of the Lord. And his vengeance is associated with the day of the Lord, which is associated with the dividing of the land. Jeremiah 51, one: I will raise up against Babylon a destroying wind. Verse 11, it says, Make bright the arrows. The Lord has raised up the spirit of the kings of the Medes for his devices against Babylon to destroy it. And then it gives you a time reference. It is the vengeance of the Lord. So the time of his vengeance is during the tribulation period when he's judging the nations for dividing the land of Israel and the city of Jerusalem. And so now in Isaiah 13, verse 1, it says the burden of Babylon... We see the judgment is associated with the tribulation period because it says in verse 8, pegs and sorrows shall take hold on them. They will be in pain as a woman that travails. And so this period of time is also called the day of the Lord. Isaiah 13 verse 1 speaks of the burden of Babylon. Verse 6, it says, for the day of the Lord is at hand. So this end time spiritual land of Babylon called in the scriptures the daughter of Babylon, it's cut off during the tribulation period as a part of the judgment of the nations for dividing the land, and it's cut off in the time of harvest. Jeremiah 50, verse 16. Cut off the sower from Babylon and him that handles the sickle in the time of harvest. Well, Yeshua explained in Matthew chapter 13, verse 39, that the harvest is the end of the age. So cut off Babylon in the end of the age. At the time of the end of this age, when we're transitioning into Messianic times. Now the prophecy is that when this end time spiritual land of Babylon, the daughter of Babylon, which is likened to the historical Babylon of old under King Nebuchadnezzar, that when it falls, there will be people living within it that will be fleeing from it. Jeremiah 51.1, I will raise up against Babylon a destroying wind. And it says in verse 45, my people, that would be Jacob, that would be people that believe in the God of Israel, that believe in Yeshua as the Messiah, my people go out of the midst of her. So then we are told regarding this prophecy of Babylon, Jeremiah 50, verse 16. For fear of the oppressing sword, they shall turn every one to his people, and they will flee every one to his own land. Now, verse 50. You that have escaped the sword. So the sword is going to come upon the land, and we're told about his people who are escaping the judgment or the sword that has come upon the land. And the instruction is, go away, stand not still. Remember the Lord afar off and let Jerusalem come to your mind. You're to flee the land and return and go to the land of Israel. You're going to let Jerusalem come to your mind. Jeremiah 50 verse 4, in those days and at that time, that is a term for the day of the Lord. It's an idiomatic expression for the day of the Lord. So in the day of the Lord, as Babylon is being judged and fallen, the children of Israel, that's the northern kingdom, that's Ephraim, that's the ten tribes, that's the house of Joseph. They will come, they and the children of Judah, that's the southern kingdom, that's the house of Judah, that's the Jewish people. And the house of Joseph and the house of Judah will come together from in Babylon. And they will seek the Lord their God, that's the Messiah. And they will come with weeping, that is, in sorrow and tears, in repentance, and even for what's happening in the land. And so we're told that there's a large contingent of the people of the God of Israel in this end-time spiritual land of Babylon that's falling. 
and his people in that land are being told to let Jerusalem come to their mind. And so what would we call the people of the God of Israel that's living in this end time spiritual land of Babylon or the daughter of Babylon? We would call them Jews and Christians. And we're told about them that they're going to ask the way to Zion, Jeremiah 50 verse 5. So why do you ask someone about something? It's because you don't know. What are they pursuing? Where are they ultimately supposed to go? Um, They're supposed to go to Zion. And what then is the Zion that they're fleeing to? Well, Zion is a term for the Messiah, who is our rock. Zion is a term for the covenant that was made with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Zion is a term for believing the covenant promise and believing that, that there was a land that was promised to the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And Zion is a term for the people that want to follow the God of Israel and follow His ways. That's His Torah. And the way in the new covenant that you follow his Torah is by his spirit. Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 33. Hebrews chapter 8, verse 10. So that's really what the people in their heart are asking for, what they're really wanting to find, what they're seeking to find. And so the conflict that we see literally physically taking place in the land, over the land, the Bible calls the controversy of Zeo. And in the conflict regarding the land itself, it is prophesied in Joel chapter 3 verse 6 that the children of Judah, that's the Jewish people, will be removed from their border. In other words, they'll be kicked out of their homes. And uh, this has already happened in certain instances in the West Bank and Judea Samaria. Um, It has happened in the Gaza in August of 2005. Now, Joel chapter 3, verse 6, it says, The children of Judah and the children of Jerusalem have you sold to the Grecians, that you might remove them far from their border. Well, who here would be the Grecians? Well, we're told in Ezekiel chapter 35 that there's a prophecy there against Esau or Edom, who's called Mount Seir. That's because historically Esau in the book of Genesis, we're told in Ezekiel 36 verse 8, that he lived in Mount Seir, which was a place of cave dwellings. Well, in the Hebrew language, the way you say a male goat is Sa'ir. And so within the place for Esau, who is named Sa'ir, we have the word Sa'ir, and so you have the same letters in the Hebrew language. And so Jacob, the people of the God of Israel, is likened to sheep. And those who oppose Jacob, Esau, he's likened unto a goat. And so we are told in the book of Daniel, in Daniel in chapter 8, verse 21, that... Greece is likened to a goat. So Esau is likened to a goat. Greece is likened to a goat. So those who are Esau or who side with Esau or practice after Esau's ways, which is Grecian, that that's who Judah is being sold to. It's being sold to those who are standing with Esau in the nations who are standing with Esau in proclamation of Ezekiel 36, 1 and 2, that Esau wants to make the mountains of Israel his possession. And so this is what the prophecy is saying, that the Jews in the land are being removed from their border. They're being kicked out of their homes. And so then we see in Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 17, I will restore health unto you. And so exiles likened to a wound, I'm going to restore health, that's ending the exile, and I'm going to heal you of your wound, the wound's the exile, the healing is the end of the exile. So the God of Israel declares that he's going to end the exile of Jacob. He's going to end the exile of northern kingdom, southern kingdom. He's going to end the exile 
of Joseph and Judah because they, the nations of the world, called you an outcast, saying, this is Zion which no man seeks after. In other words, the nations of the world don't believe like you do. They're not pursuing this path. They're not following this belief system. Well, in the Hebrew, where it's translated, they called you an outcast, they called, it's the Strong's number 20, they called, it's the Strong's number 7121. In the Strong's Hebrew Dictionary, it's the Hebrew word kara. And kara means to approach and speak to in a challenging or an aggressive way. So, outcast is the Strong's number 5080. In the Strong's Hebrew Dictionary, it's the Hebrew word nadak, which means to drive out or expel. So, in the Hebrew, it's saying that the God of Israel is going to restore health to his people. He's going to end the exile. Because they're approaching his people in a challenging and aggressive way to drive them out. What's the aggressive way that they're saying? They are in an aggressive way saying that you need to make possible a Palestinian state based upon 67 borders with East Jerusalem as its capital. So the prophecy is when the nations stand with Esau to do this, that's when the God of Israel is going to end the exile of his people. So in the conflict between Jacob and Esau, given that Esau is uh, likened or characteristically associated with a goat, there's a prophecy in Zechariah chapter 9, verse 13, that the sons of Zeal, meaning those who believe and seek to follow the ways of the God of Israel, believe the covenant that was made with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, believe that Yeshua is the Messiah, and they seek to follow his Torah, that the sons of Zion will be in conflict with the sons of Greece. It says, when I've bent Judah for me and filled the bow with Ephraim, so it's talking about Judah and Ephraim, Judah, southern kingdom, Ephraim, northern kingdom, and I raised up your sons, O Zion. And so those within Judah and Ephraim who believe in the covenant that was made with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and want to follow the Torah of the God of Israel, and ultimately believe that Yeshua is the Messiah, they are the sons of Zion. And they will be in conflict with the sons of Greece, that is Esau, and those who oppose the God of Israel, the covenant that was made with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So, in the sons of Zion opposing the sons of Greece, when the sons of Greece come in and oppose and declare and recognize a Palestinian state based upon 1967 borders with East Jerusalem as its capital, the sons of Zion will rise up against the sons of Greece. And this is what happened historically from the book of Daniel when you had a Greek ruler named Antiochus Epiphanes who he tried to impose Greek rule and Greek ways upon uh, the known world at that time. And this included the area which we call today the land of Israel. And there was a declaration that you must follow Greek ways under penalty. And you also, in following Greek ways, that you cannot follow the Torah of the God of Israel. Historically, there was a group of people, a group of priests, who rose up in opposition to this imposition. They were known as the Maccabees. And so their victory in the conflict is celebrated by the holiday of Hanukkah, which means dedication. That there's going to be a prophetic repeat of this associated with the end of the exile of the 12 tribes of Israel in the greater exodus, that the sons of Zion will rebel against the sons of Greece when the sons of Greece try to impose a Palestinian state. In their rebellion, they will stand for the covenant that was made with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And in the physical, in the natural, they will declare biblical zeal. And we are told about biblical zeal being born in one day at the time of the day of the Lord that is associated with the tribulation period and Jacob's trouble. Isaiah chapter 66, verse 8, it is written, Who has heard such a thing? Who has seen such things? Shall the earth be made to bring forth in one day? Or shall a nation be born at once? So the prophecy is a nation being born in one day. In the text, what is the name of that nation? It's Zion. Because it says, as soon as Zion travailed. So the nation being born is called in the text Zion. 
And it says, as soon as she travailed, travail is a reference or an allusion to the tribulation period or Jacob's trouble that this nation, Zion, is going to be born during the tribulation or Jacob's trouble, the darkness part of the day of the Lord, that as soon as she travails, she's going to bring forth her children. Who are her children? They are the ones who believe in the covenant made with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They are the sons of Zion. And so the prophecy says in Isaiah 66, verse 14, when you see this, when you see Zion being born in the day, during the time of Jacob's trouble, that for those who understand the scriptures and the prophecies and know what it means, your heart will rejoice and your bones will flourish like an herb. And the hand of the Lord will be known to his servants in his indignation toward his enemies. So when we studied the principles and the patterns of the greater exodus, we saw that one of the principles that occurred when judgment was on, upon Pharaoh in Egypt that he made a distinction between his people who lived in the land of Goshen and the judgments that he brought upon Egypt and upon Pharaoh. And so that is a prophetic foreshadowing that when Zion is established during the tribulation period, that the God of Israel will, will once again make a distinction between his people that believe in the covenant made with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the sons of Zion, and he'll make a distinction between his people and those who oppose, that is, the sons of Greece. Next, let's look a little bit closer to the scripture that we just looked at, Isaiah 66, verse 8, which reads, As soon as Zion travailed, she brought forth her children. Zion is the Strong's number 6726 in the Strong's Hebrew Dictionary. And if we look at the word Zion, it says that it means a dry or a parched or a, a desolate place, that it's the same or it contains the same letters as the Strong's number 6725 in the Strong's Hebrew Dictionary, which we pronounce as Zion, and Zion means a sign. And so, in the Hebrew language, Hebrew words that have the same letters belong to the same family of words, and within the same family, there is an associated meaning with all the words that contain the same letters. And so since Zion has the same, which means sign, has the same letters as Zion, we say in English Zion, that we could understand then that in the family association of the meaning of the word, that Zion means a sign. That being the case, we're going to find the meaning of Zion, which means a sign associated with Zion in Jeremiah chapter 31, where in verse 15, Rachel was weeping for her children, and she's told in verse 16 to refrain from weeping, because in verse 17, there's hope that her children will return to their own border and the exile. See, as long as Rachel's children are in exile, she's weeping, she's mourning. And when her, the exile of her children ends, then she's comforted. And who is specifically mentioned in the prophecy in Jeremiah chapter 31, given that uh, Rachel had Joseph and Benjamin. And so Joseph is associated with the northern kingdom. Benjamin is associated with the southern kingdom. Benjamin is linked with Judah of the southern kingdom. But in Jeremiah 31, who is mentioned is Ephraim. Son of Joseph is Ephraim, my dear son. So regarding Ephraim returning to his own border, the northern kingdom referring, returning to their own border, it says in the English translation in Jeremiah 31 verse 21, set you up way marks. Well, this is the word Zion, but in the original text, it's just written with the letters that are the same letters as Zion. Because whether it's Zion or Zion is based upon where you put the vowels. And in the written Hebrew, in 
everyday conversation and in newspapers, the vowels are understood by people who know the language. And so therefore, you could read in Jeremiah 31, 21 as set you up zeon, set you up zeon. So zeon means the sign, set you up zeon. So when zeon is set up, and the way zeon will be set up in the natural, in the physical, is when in Zechariah chapter 12, verses 5 and 6, that the governors of Judah will rise up in opposition to Esau and the nation seeking to divide the land of Israel and the city of Jerusalem, creating a Palestinian state with East Jerusalem as its capital. And they will declare in not accepting the imposition of a Palestinian state, they will declare their opposition to it and their belief in the covenant that was made with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And when forced and pressed to do so, they will declare an independent state in Judea, Samaria, in the West Bank, in the mountains of Israel, with Jerusalem as its capital. And so from Isaiah 66, verse 8, they'll make that declaration in one day. They will declare Zion. And biblically, it's the governors of Judah who are doing this and they're going to really stir the pot as you might say because in Zechariah 12 verse 6 it says in that day that's the day of the Lord I will make the governors of Judah like a hearth of fire among the wood and like a torch of fire in a sheaf and so they're going to cause the the conflict to intensify and what is written in Isaiah 66 verse 8 that Zion is born in one day that this is what Revelation 12 is making a reference to. The prophecy of Isaiah 66 verse 8. We're here in Revelation 12 1. It says there, ap there appeared a great sign in heaven. In the description of the sign is a woman that has a crown on her head and 12 stars above her head. So the sign is a crown and that's ruling and reigning 12 stars. That's the 12 tribes of Israel. So the sign is the ruling and reigning of the 12 tribes of Israel. In the 12 tribes of Israel rule and reign when the Messiah comes and ends their exile and he sets up a kingdom and Israel is at the head of all nations. So now this is a sign that this is about to come about. But Zion in Hebrew in the family association of the meaning of the word means a sign. So I could read Revelation 12, 1, there ap appeared a great Zion. The Zion is the woman that has a crown and 12 stars. And she's clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet. Well, what's under your feet you have authority over. And so the sun is a reference to Greco-Roman Christianity, which mixed the belief in Yeshua as the Messiah with sun worship. And then the moon is a symbol of Islam. And so... Jacob won't have to contend with the mixed worship and the paganism that has brought in to the faith and believing that Yeshua is the Messiah, nor will they have to contend with the opposition of Esau expressed through the religion of Islam. And so with this sign appearing and the way in which the birth of it is going to look is a declaration of an independent state by the governors of Judah in Judea, Samaria, or the West Bank, where they declare that being an independent state, which they're going to call Zion, and declare Jerusalem as its capital, that this declaration is being brought about with great pain, with great travail, that is likened and associated with the woman that has child. Revelation 12, 2. And she, being with child, cried, travailing in birth, in pain to be delivered. So in the natural, according to the prophecy in Isaiah in chapter 66, it's going to look like this child, this declaration of an independent state is going to fail. It looks like the birth of Zion is going to be aborted. That's what's going to appear like in the natural. 
And we can see this from Isaiah 66, verse 9. Shall I bring to the birth and not cause to bring forth, says the Lord? Shall I cause to bring forth and shut the womb? Have I brought the circumstances and the situation such that the conditions are that this is now going to happen according to the prophecies? And then it not happen? And the God of Israel answer is it will happen it says in verse 10 rejoice with jerusalem and be glad with her all that love her rejoice for joy with her all you that mourn for her and so isaiah 66 verses 8 and 9 is what's being referred to in revelation in chapter 12 in verses 1 and 2 so now the setting of the book of Revelation, and even Revelation chapter 12, is a vision that John, the disciple of Yeshua, received when he was imprisoned in the Isle of Patmos. And he says in Revelation 1.10, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. The Lord's day is the day of the Lord. So he's being shown in the spirit. He's being shown the future about events that are taking place in the day of the Lord. And so from this woman giving birth in travail, Isaiah 66, Revelation 12, upon given birth, it says in Isaiah 66, verse 8, that she brings forth her children. That's the sons of Zion. That's the gathering uniting the 12 tribes of Israel. That's the greater exodus. So it says in Revelation chapter 12, verse 6, And the woman fled into the wilderness, and she had a place there prepared by God for 1,203 score days. Now, this 1,260 days is going to be the duration of the greater exodus. That's going to be the duration of time where he takes his people from the nations and brings them back to the land of Israel. And it says in Revelation 12, 14, to the woman was given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness. So remember the principle and the pattern that we see in the Torah? When the children of Israel were redeemed out of Egypt on their way to the promised land, on their way to receive the promise and the blessing that was made to Abraham, where in Genesis 17 he was given the land of Canaan, and walking to receive that inheritance that they went through the wilderness. And so on the way to receive the promise that was made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the people literally went through the wilderness. Of course, they was in the wilderness for 40 years. And so this is a principle or, or a prophecy or prophetic foreshadowing that the wilderness that the children of Israel were in when they came out of Egypt, that is a prophecy of being in the wilderness of the nations. As we can see in Ezekiel in chapter 20. And we're going to be uh, begin reading there in verse, Ezekiel chapter 20, in verses 33 and 34. As I live, says the Lord God, with a mighty hand, with a stretched out arm, and with fury poured out, will I rule over you. And I will bring you out from the people and gather you out of all the countries where you've been scattered with a mighty hand, and with a stretched out arm, and with fury poured out. You see, the phraseology, mighty hand, and with a mighty arm, well, that was the phraseology when Yeshua brought the children of Israel out of Egypt when he judged Pharaoh and when he judged Egypt. He said he would bring them out with a mighty hand and with a mighty arm. Well, that's the same phraseology that's used when he's going to gather his people from the nations of the world where they've been scattered. And just as when he brought them out of Egypt, he took them in the wilderness on the way to the promised land. It says in Ezekiel 20, verse 35, I will bring you into the wilderness of the people. And there in the wilderness of the people, I will plead with you face to face. Like I pleaded with your fathers in the wilderness in the land of Egypt, so will I plead with you. So coming out of Egypt on the way to the promised land, they went in the wilderness. So in returning to the land of Israel in ending the exile, the greater exodus, in the journey of the greater exodus, it begins in the nations of the world where you're at. And where you're at in the nations is the wilderness. It's the wilderness of the peoples. And so the journey 
the greater Exodus journey that the Messiah is going to lead his people back because it's the Messiah that gathers and unites the 12 tribes of Israel. He's going to bring his people back from the nations of the world where they've been scattered and he's going to take them back to the land from the wilderness, from the wilderness of the people. So they will be in the wilderness. How long? For 1,260 days. So the 1,260 days, which is the time frame of the Great Tribulation, is going to be the time of the Greater Exodus. The Greater Exodus is a three and a half year period. It begins at Passover at the start of the Great Tribulation. And the duration of time by which the Messiah is going to bring his people from the nations back to the land is 1,260 days, three and a half years, or 42 months. And so when he did bring them out historically in Exodus, in chapter 19, we have this phraseology. It says in verse 4, you have seen what I did unto the Egyptians, how I bear you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Well, in the prophecy in Revelation 12, it says the woman was given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness. And so uh, we see here by looking at and understanding the principles and patterns of the God of Israel that the principles and patterns that we study in the Torah, in the lives of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, in the history of the nation of Israel, that those patterns and principles are critical in order for us to give insight and understand the greater exodus in how it takes place. And so the next thing is that from the birth of biblical Zion, that is the declaration by the governors of Judah of an independent state in Judea, Samaria, in the West Bank, in the mountains of Israel, where Jerusalem is declared its capital. It is through this that the Messiah is going to be revealed to his people and to the world. You see, Yeshua prayed in John in chapter 17 verse 21 that they all may be one he's praying for the gathering uniting the 12 tribes of Israel as you father are in me and I in you that they may be one in us that the world will know that you sent me and so it's from this event that Messiah is fully revealed to the world regarding who he is but it's through this event he's revealed to his people and as the prophecy says in Hosea chapter 1 and verse 11 that northern kingdom, southern kingdom, the house of Jacob, will appoint themselves one head when their exile is over. So this is the understanding behind Revelation chapter 12, verse 5, where it says, And she, the woman, Zion, the one with the crown and twelve stars, she brought forth a man-child. That's the Messiah. And the man-child is to rule all nations with the rod of iron. We see that Yeshua rules all nations with the rod of iron in Revelation chapter 19, verse 15, where it says, Out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. And this parallels the prophecy back to Isaiah 66, when it says that Zion was delivered of a man-child. And now finally, there's a prophecy regarding this in Psalm 87, verse 5. Of Zion, it will, it will be said, this and that man was born in her. And so, the, the people will receive Yeshua as the Messiah through the birth of biblical Zion and Messiah is born in their hearts and that is how and why Yeshua ultimately rules and reigns from Zion because that man was born in her, in Zion, in the Messiah. And so the people's born Unto the Messiah, the Messiah is born in the hearts and the lives of his people. That is going to conclude part five of this teaching on the principles of the greater exodus.